So welcome, everyone. My name is Saurabh Badan, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you for another special talk in our value investing series. We have a very special speaker with us today. But before I get into his introduction, I want to talk briefly about this term, moat, which you're going to be hearing a lot about in today's talk. Well, according to Wikipedia, a moat is a deep, broad ditch, either dry or filled with water, that surrounds a castle, other building or town, historically to provide it with a preliminary line of defense. However, thanks to Mr. Buffett and a legion of value investors, this word, moat, has become an excellent metaphor to identify companies with durable competitive advantage. Very few people, though, have managed to develop and synthesize a framework that systematically helps to identify moats from an investor's perspective. Pat Dorsey, our author for today, has done a great service to students and individual investors trying to do exactly that. In his best-selling book, The Little Book That Builds Wealth, he has shared actionable insights to identify moats in the business world. His book is also a great introduction for anyone interested in learning more about value investing. We are very, very pleased to have Pat here with us. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in wel welcoming Pat Dorsey. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for the kind intro. I'm glad we have the technology at least working mostly uh, here in the, one of the world's most successful technology companies. Um, um, you would have thought I was presenting in Redmond, Washington. No, I'm joking. Um, sorry, sorry. It was just. It was right down the middle. It was too easy. It was too easy. Uh, you give me a fat pitch, I'm going to hit it. Or, inve or invest in it, I suppose. Um, so we've done the intros. I'm Pat. Um, used to run Morningstar's equity research group. Uh, currently have my own investment firm called Dorsey Asset Management, uh, which is a global firm, a global mandate. We can invest anywhere in the world, anywhere, any market cap. We're very concentrated. And our goal really is to find 10 to 15 of the world's most competitively advantaged businesses that can compound at high rates over time, invest in them, and then leave them alone to make lots of money over time. That's our job, and that's what we're actively engaged in doing right now. And the framework we use uh, is in large part based on the work I did at Morningstar and the concept of economic moats and reinvesting capital at high rates of return. And that's what I want to talk about today. So the basic foundation of thinking about economic moats and competitive advantage is that, shocker, capitalism works. And that capital seeks the highest returns possible. If a company is making a lot of money, others will seek to compete with it. That you know, intuitively makes sense. If I wrote each of you a $50 million VC check and said, go start a business, you would probably try to do something profitable. If you are smart, you probably would not start airlines. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Um, high profits attract competition. I mean, as surely as night follows day. So intuitively, this makes sense. Empirically, it makes sense as well. If you go back over time and look at, say, take T1, companies in the highest decile of returns on capital, and roll the clock forward 10, 15 years, and look at that cohort of companies, most will have lower levels of profitability. Most will have lower returns on capital, as their returns on capital have drifted down to some mean as competition has come in. Of course, there is a minority of businesses where that's not the case. So you know, most businesses, you see high returns on capital decrease over time as competition comes in. However, there is a very small minority of businesses that enjoy many years of high returns on capital. Uh, they essentially beat the odds. They defy economic gravity. And the question simply becomes, how? And in my view, it's because they've created structural advantages, economic moats, a way of insulating themselves, buffering themselves against the competition that enables them to maintain supernormal returns on capital longer than academic theory and the averages would suggest. Because absent a moat, competition destroys excess returns, period and full stop. Any highly profitable business that is easy to compete with, you will see that come down over time. 
Um, very common in the fashion industry, very common, say, in, you know, if you guys remember back NVIDIA and what was the other big graphics company, chip company? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they would swap market shares like every six months. Mm -hmm. You know, what had the best chip? Oh, no, I've got the best chip. Da, 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 da. And there's no moat there. The moat was just, what do I got that's great today? And then you got a lot of smart engineers at the other place trying to make the next best thing. So the basics of moats are that they're structural and sustainable qualities that are inherent to the business. A moat is part and parcel of the business that you're looking at. It's not a hot product. We all probably remember the Krispy Kreme debacle. Uh, they taste good, but you know, sugar is not a moat. Um, <laughs> Heelys, anybody remember Heelys? Or have you remember those, those little shoes with a wheel in the heel? That was an $800 million company at one point. I, I kid you, I mean, yes, I, you know, I, I am, as Dave Barry would say, I am not making this up. Um, people were valuing Heelys as if it had a moat. Aside from the massive product liability issues, uh, once basically schools started banning them. And so that's a problem if your target audience of 12-year-olds can't buy your product anymore. Uh, and so that, that business went to hell pretty fast. Um, it's not just a cool piece of technology. We talked about NVIDIA and the graphics companies a moment ago. Remember iOmega? Remember that was going to be the thing. It's just a cool piece of technology. And frankly, any cool piece of technology can be replicated by other smart engineers. Unless there's some switching cost, some lock-in effect that occurs, uh, that you know, or an industry standard is created. But you know, anything that one smart bunch of guys can develop, there's probably another smart bunch of guys somewhere else trying to make it even better. And of course, it's not the biggest market share. You will often hear companies talk about, oh, we're the biggest, we're going for market share. Let's think about GM, let's think about Compaq. It didn't work out so well. Big is not a moat. In fact, small is often a better moat than big. Moats generally manifest themselves in pricing power. A company that can't raise prices is unlikely to have a strong moat. And in fact, if you invest, this is a test often that businesses are losing competitive advantage. If you hear a company say, well, you, know, you have a company who typically raises prices 2, 3, 4% every year. You know, they're able to kind of keep pricing power moving up. And then one year, suddenly they don't. They say, well, the economy's tough, or you know, we want to take it easy on the customers this year. That's a load of crap. It means that something has changed in that industry. There's a competitor out there. There is some event going on that you may not be aware of that's causing them to lose that pricing power. Because if you can take price, you will take price as a business. And so if companies that lose that pricing power, that's usually the first sign that their moat is eroding. So what I want to do next is talk about the four kinds of moats that uh, I identified when we were at Morningstar and that I still think make sense today. The way we identified these was by going back about, this was, would have been the later, about 50 years of CompuStat data. And it was pretty simple, just looking at businesses that had maintained returns on capital above cost of capital for 15 years plus. You know, it's not a huge data set. And then you basically say, what are the common characteristics of these businesses? What are the similarities of these businesses? And that's where we kind of teased out these four categories. And they've proven to work out pretty well. These are what we, we introduced the moat ratings at Morningstar in about 01. And so now we've had about 12, 15, 13 years. And the businesses we initially identified as being wide moat businesses that fell into these buckets have maintained higher returns on capital than their peers. So the, the, the empirical results seem to bear out the theory. Um, first kind of intangible asset is a brand. Um, and a brand is valuable if it either increases your willingness to pay or lowers your search costs. And this is really important. It's not just that it's well known. Because you think of like, say, Sony. We've all heard of Sony, right? Sony is often ranked as one of the 20 most valuable brands on the planet by the business week, brand week thingy that, that happens every year. But let me just do a quick survey in this room. How many of you would pay 20% more for a Sony DVD player? <laughs> One hand? Maybe, maybe Any hands? Maybe 15 years ago. Or 20 years maybe 15 years ago. That's exactly it. And like right now, you do see like the Sony Bravia TVs getting a little bit of a price premium over others because it's newer. DVDs were newer. But consumer electronics is fast cycle stuff. right? What's new today is old next week. And so the fact that Sony is well known, and we've heard a lot about it, does not contribute one bit to its competitive advantage. In fact, I would argue Sony could probably save a heck of a lot of money by not advertising, or advertising very little. 
you know, they, on Michigan Ave in Chicago, where I work, they have this super expensive flagship store with all kinds of cool stuff you can play with, and I'm sure they're paying God knows what in rent. Useless, because that brand doesn't change your behavior. By contrast, let's look at Tiffany. Tiffany will charge you 20% more for the exact same diamond that you can buy from Blue Nile or Zales or Hellsberg or whoever you want. 20% is the value of that pale blue box. I can guarantee you the cardboard ain't that expensive. <laughs> okay? But that's what but you know, as the giver of a diamond, that you'll probably get a bigger smile off the recipient if it's in a <laughs> Tiffany box than if it's not in a Tiffany box. So they can charge it. And so that brand has value, right? That band increases your willingness to pay. And there's value there. You also have brands that lower search costs. So think about Coca-Cola or Wrigley Gum. You know, you don't pay a lot more for Coke versus Pepsi, but you know you like Coke, so you go there. You know, you like Heinz, so you grab it off the shelf, because you don't want to sit there and compare ketchup prices for 20 minutes before buying the ketchup. It's three bucks. My kids like ketchup. Let's go get the ketchup. I mean, we go through ketchup in vats at my house. I have twin seven-year-olds, and I think ketchup is like our fifth food group. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so brands, again, a brand changes consumer behavior uh, by increasing the willingness to pay or reducing the search cost, then it has value. Just being well known doesn't mean anything at all. Patents, obviously a patent is a legal monopoly, but they are subject to expiration, challenge, and piracy. And so you want to be very careful of a business, you see this a lot in like specialty pharmaceuticals, where you have one asset, one drug, driving all of your economic value, that patent gets challenged, you're dead. And last time I checked, patent lawyers drive really nice cars. And there's a reason for that, which is that patents are valuable to challenge. And so if they can be challenged, they will be challenged. So the, the, when you want to rely on patents as a moat when you have a portfolio of them. That, you know, it's hard to invalidate one or the other. Think of Qualcomm, think of Arm Holdings, where there's this huge portfolio of patents. And then finally, licenses and approvals. So you have a license to do something that is not many people can do, or an approval. That is a pretty solid economic moat. Casinos. Not easy to get a casino license. You have six of them in Macau. That's it. They ain't giving out anymore. Uh, landfills. No one likes to live near a landfill. So municipalities don't give out tons of landfill licenses because then nobody wants to live there. That reduces the tax base. So once you have a landfill or a gravel pit, you probably aren't going to get a whole lot more of them. Aircraft parts are the same thing. Have to be FAA certified. And that's a huge moat in the aircraft parts industry. Most aircraft parts are sole source. They have one manufacturer who makes them. And so they get about a 40% margin on aftermarket. It's a beautiful business. If you're doing, selling a brand, if you're a company, here's what you want to look for when you're looking at brand-based companies. Brands are valuable if they deliver a consistent or aspirational experience. Now, consistency lowers search costs and drives loyalty. So what you don't want to do is change the damn product. That's the stupidest thing possible. Remember New Coke? <coughs> Idiotic. Schlitz. Schlitz used to be the second highest selling beer in the US, most volume in the US. Now, not so much, right? And the reason was they changed the way it was made. They changed the taste of Schlitz. Why would you do this? <laughs> you know, recently I thought, I mean, there was something like, like I think I was with the Heinz, or there was actually a ketchup that was going to lower the amount of sugar content. They were going to change the recipe. And you just go, stop. If people are buying this, why change it? Aspiration, by contrast, increases willingness to pay. So what you want to do is create scarcity and exclusivity. Very interesting example, Tiffany stores. Now, Tiffany is unique in that we think of it as a very expensive brand, but over 40% of their revenue comes from stuff that sells for under 200 bucks. Weird, right? You wouldn't think about that. And it's, it's brilliant. I mean, they're one of the only companies that they, they can hit volume and hit high price. Um, but here's how they do it, one of the ways they do it, by maintaining the brand. You would think that the stuff that drives 40% of your sales, that'd be at the front of the store, right? You want people to get easy access to that. No, 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 no. Go into a Tiffany store. The cheap stuff is at the back. So the expensive stuff, the stuff that costs more than a Tesla, that's sitting in the front of the store because that keeps the value of the brand up. That maintains an aura of exclusivity and scarcity, and so they keep the brand value up. Or Patek Philippe, a uh, very expensive watch brand. The slogan, which I love, you don't own a Patek Philippe, you take care of it for the next generation. 
I mean, what a great image, right, for those of us who can afford $50,000 watches. Um, but it maintains that scarcity and exclusivity value. And again, let's look at it, if you're looking at brand-based companies, aspirations differ. So you want to think about companies that can adapt. A great example is Jack Daniels, owned by Brown, Brown Foreman. So these are two different Jack Daniels ads. Um, I'm going to do the translations based on what I've been told. I don't speak Russian or Chinese. Um, so this says, happy birthday, Mr. Jack. And if you can look at it, see it, it's the same image we have of Jack Daniels here. The frontier, the cowboy, old school. And in Russia, that works. Because you, you know, a lot of Russians own dachas. They like to get out of the city and get back to kind of their sort of Slavic roots. Now compare that with this. Jack Daniels ad in China. You're in a very high-end bar, very urban, very smooth, very cool. And I mean, I've gotten this translated, but I may have anyone can any I see a few folks here who might speak to you wanna translate that for me? So it's definitely mean confidence is not by our mouth, but from other people's eyes. Confidence is not in your out of your mouth, but comes from other people's eyes. In other words, confidence is how people see you. Right? Totally different, right? Because imagine in China if you had this ad that basically was like, you should go back to the village you came from. <laughs> That's going to sell a premium spirit, right? Uh huh. Uh, you know? So again, but here you see this ad adaptation. That's what you want to see in a brand based company. Second kind of economic moat switching costs. Very simple. Does the cost of switching to a competing product outweigh the benefits? What you want to do is look for companies that integrate with the company or customer's business. So the upfront costs of implementation get huge payback from renewals. Think about an Oracle database, for example. If you're P&G, if you're Citigroup, and you're running on an Oracle database, ripping that out is virtually impossible. It's not impossible, but it's really, 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 really hard. I mean, if, if, if you showed up today, I mean, if Google, for example, built an amazing database and showed up to P&G and said, we've got Google Base, and it's 15% faster and 20% cheaper than Oracle's best product, P&G would say, yes, and I will have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars and however many man hours ripping out what I have now, and my business will probably blow up when I do that. So the switching costs are very high. And so Oracle can raise price 2 to 3% every year. See this a lot with uh, enterprise software companies. You also see it with data processors, people that integrate tightly with the customer's business. You can also sell an ongoing service relationship. So think of um, elevators. Once you have an elevator in a building, it probably ain't coming out again. Um, and so you get elevator companies like Otis, which is part of United Technologies, uh, Kohn, which is a Finnish company, Schindler, which is German. And their goal is to have a high, what's called a attach rate to attach a service contract to the elevator. Because once that elevator's in there, it ain't coming out again. And so you get this long service relationship. Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce typically sells its jet engines on what's called power by the hour. They actually sell it, and then you pay for it based on how much you use it. You don't just pay for it up front, and then someone else maintains it. So that's a way of increasing the switching cost. And then you can provide a product with a very high benefit to cost ratio. A uh, favorite example here is a company called Fastenal here in the US. You know, if you have one bolt on your assembly line that goes down, and then you have a whole bunch of unionized guys standing around basically getting paid for not doing anything, you will pay a lot of money to get that bolt back on the line really quickly. And so that product doesn't have a very high economic cost in terms of how much you spend for the bolt, but it has a huge benefit to your organization. You, uh, Fuchs Petrolube, uh, or Lubrizol, which Berkshire bought a while back, same thing, lubricants. If you have a lubricant, that can increase the uptime of a giant mining machine down in a hole by 10%. So you don't have to take it down for maintenance as often. You don't have to take it apart and lube everything. And you get more productivity out of it. And that lubricant costs even 20% more than the competing lubricant. It's such a tiny cost of the overall part, of the overall cost of running that machine. Why not? So this high benefit cost ratio is really a cool thing to look for when you're looking for businesses with switching costs. You've got the network effect, which is simply providing a service that increases in value as the number of users expands. You can aggregate demand between fragmented parties. Think of distributors. Uh, Henry Schein is a dental distributor. So basically, most dentists are you know, little owner operators, two, three, four, five dentists in a practice. And then they've got to buy stuff. They've got to buy those obnoxious cotton things that stick in your mouth and suck up the saliva and give you cotton mouth, literally. Um, you know, you've got to buy dental drills and all kinds of stuff. And basically, what they're doing is aggregating 
fragmented demand, fragmented supply, and they bring the two together and extract a lot of economic rents by doing that. Um, one thing to watch for here is that one reason the network effect works so well is the nonlinearity of nodes versus connections. So if you have a web and you have you know, the number of nodes in that web goes from one to two to three to four, the number of connections increases exponentially. So that is something that makes it very hard to replicate a network once the network gains scale, uh, something that Googlers should be pretty familiar with, I think. Um, one thing you want to watch for, though, is radial versus interactive networks. So the interactive network is what I just described, the web, where each node interacts with the other. A radial network is less valuable. So this is a good lesson I learned at Morningstar when we looked at Western Union. So Western Union you know, sends a lot of, you know, helps people send money from place to place. And they talk about, we have the most number of branches of any money transfer organization in the world, which is true. The problem is that no one is sending money from Bangladesh to Mexico City. They're sending money from Mexico City to Chicago, or from Mexico City to LA, or from Bangladesh to Chicago. We have a huge Bangladeshi community there. No one's sending money from Bangladesh to Mexico City or vice versa. So that route means nothing. So it's basically a series of channels, a series of spokes off different nodes that are easier for a competitor to pick off by underpricing service in that node. So radial networks are much, much less robust than interactive ones, we found. And then the final uh, type of moat, cost advantages. This is uh, you know, kind of, kind of self-explanatory. But the thing is there's a couple of differences here that you should look for when you're looking at companies. A process-based advantage is basically inventing a cheaper way to do something that is hard to replicate quickly. Southwest did this. Dell did this. Ryanair did this. Inditex, which is, owns the Zara brand you may be familiar with, great example that you know, everyone, you know, they had you know, their, the clothes made in Sri Lanka, the clothes made in, Colo in Bangladesh because it was really cheap. But of course, because of transport links, you have to basically make a fashion bet six months in advance. What Inditex figured out was that if they nearshore it, if they get the stuff made in North Africa, get the stuff made in Eastern Europe, they could have much faster response times, much faster responses to different fashion trends. Now, you can copy that, right? You can copy that, but it works pretty well while you're doing it. And so process-based cost advantages tend to work well, but then they get copied eventually. Southwest no longer has the lowest uh, cost per available seat mile. People saw what they did and copied it. Scale, by contrast, when you spread your fixed costs over a large base, that tends to be much, much more robust. So think about this big network of brown, brown UPS vans going around a neighborhood. What's the additional cost of putting one more package on the UPS van? De minimis, right? And so your margin on that is very, very high. Very difficult to compete. Good example, DHL, which is a wonderfully run business, has a very dense network in Europe. They lost over a billion dollars trying to compete with UPS and FedEx in the ground market in the US. Couldn't do it, simply because they couldn't scale up. There weren't as many yellow vans as there were brown vans and blue and white vans. Um, Scale-based advantages, especially in distribution, are incredibly robust. And you can have a niche where you establish minimum efficient scale. There are some niches, some industries, that can only profitably support one or two players. If another player comes in, spends the money to get in, returns come down so that nobody makes any money, so that new entrant never comes in the market. That can be, a, you know, the businesses often can't grow very well because they're kind of trapped there, but they can be enormously profitable. So what about management? You notice I haven't said a word about management yet. There's a great quote from Warren Buffett that good jockeys will do well on good horses, but not on broken down nags. So this is a professional jockey on a goat. He is a very good manager. Sadly, he is on a bad vehicle called a goat. So if you enter this in a race, he's probably going to lose. By contrast, if you got me, and I don't even know how to ride a horse, as long as I don't fall off, I probably beat the goat. Because the horse is better suited for winning races than the goat. You're not going to get much milk out of it. The goat is better for that. But it's very well suited for winning races. So the key here is that you want to get a good horse. You want to look for good horses. It's not that the jockey is irrelevant. It's that even the best jockey, if he's on a goat, isn't going to make you a lot of money or win many races. Managers matter in the context of the moat. And the way to think about this is very simple. The required level of managerial skill is inversely related to the quality of the business. 
The worse the business, the better the manager. The better the business, uh, as long as management isn't that stupid, you'll do fine. If it's a really bad business, you better have an awesome manager. This is Ryanair. O'Leary is an absolute genius. He's a jerk, and customers hate flying Ryanair. But he has created an amazing, amazing business. Ryanair is scale advantages to die for. By contrast, if you have a great business, genius is not needed. You saw where this was going, I know. He's actually, what, what, what that actually means is, here's what's happened to Microsoft's moat while I've been in charge. Um, I, it's, yeah, it's an easy target here at Google, but, and, but it's true. I mean, you know, I mean, Steve Ballmer essentially spent 12 years setting money on fire at Microsoft, as far as I can tell. What do you think about Twitter? Uh, um, well, Twitter. Um, Never followed it much. And also, I haven't, that wasn't, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the question was, what about Twitter? Um, I, I haven't figured out what the monetization model is. I haven't figured out how they make money. I mean, they may have some secret theory. I just don't know what it is. I, but I haven't spent much time on it. Although, I think it was founded by a guy named Dorsey, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I probably should look at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the key here is that moats can buffer management mistakes. Microsoft minted money despite Steve Ballmer. Despite them shoveling money, dirt in the moat every day, the core office, the core Windows franchises were strong enough that the business overall maintained pretty high returns on capital. New Coke didn't kill Coca-Cola because the business was robust enough, the brand is strong enough. Moody's put profits before integrity, actively screwed investors, and still cranked out a 40% operating margin. That's a pretty good moat. But even a genius like David Neeleman couldn't change the fact that JetBlue is an airline, which is the worst industry known to mankind. I mean, he's an amazing manager. If you've ever met him, read any of his books, seen him speak, he's incredible, he's inspirational. You know, JetBlue was like 30 odd times earnings when it went public because it had leather seats and TV. I mean, an airline will never have lower costs than the day it opens for business. Why? Planes don't get newer, they get older. Employees don't get less seniority, they get more. So the planes cost more to run, the employees want more money. So the cost structure is inevitably bound to decline. Again, great jockey on a goat. Good managers are constantly looking for ways to widen a company's moat. Think about Amazon's focus on the customer experience. It's not so much about scale, it's about the customer experience. Here's a great, uh, let me try this here. I've done try this at other talks around the world. How many of you have bought something off Amazon without checking the price elsewhere? OK, that's like 2 thirds, 3 quarters of the hands. Isn't that an amazing statistic right there? I mean, how hard is it to click to another website? What's the caloric cost of moving your mouse? It's not high, right? But, and so, but I, I've talked to probably 45 CFA societies around the world. I get that's about, about the same number of hands that go up. Except in Germany. The Germans didn't seem to, you know, I mean, maybe Amazon hasn't done as well. Amazon has not been as, I mean, there's more, there's Alondo, there's a lot of other e-retailers there, but in the US, this is the response you get. And a lot of that, a lot of this is the customer experience, right? Trust matters more online than offline. And I give Amazon enormous credit for figuring this out early. That offline, in a regular physical store, I give you money, you give me a good, and we're finished. There's no trust involved. Online, I have to trust you send me what I ordered. I have to trust you don't steal my credit card number. I have to trust it arrives when you say it will. I have to trust you'll take it back if you say you will. There's a lot of trust involved. And that, enables, that enabled the ability to build a moat, build a brand in retailing, which is a really tough industry to do that in. Think about Costco's focus on using scale to lower costs. Costco gets bigger, cost savings go right back to the customer. That brings in more customers, which allows more cost savings that go right back to the customer. That's what drives their business. That's all they think about every day. Now, by contrast, bad managers invest capital outside a company's moat, which lowers overall returns on capital. This process is called diversification, or setting fire to large piles of cash. Okay, This is basically what you don't want to see a company doing. Example, Cisco moving into consumer markets, the Netgear acquisition, I think it was. What on earth was that? You had this gorgeous, sticky business in enterprise, and you start selling consumer electronics that any moron just buys off the shelf at Circuit City. 
I mean, I used to, my set-top box at home used to be a Cisco, and I would just curse that thing every time I looked at it. Because it was just the worst business to go into. I mean, just you know, fast product cycles, no competitive advantage. Um, the, the whole network-centric home, so what? Um, remember Garmin? Remember, remember the, anybody remember the Nuvi handset? No, if nobody? OK, so Garmin <laughs> had this great franchise, uh, partially in GPS devices uh, in their car, but also a much better franchise in avionics. So the, you know, your uh, business jets, regional jets often have Garmin as the GPS device in there. Uh, you own a plane, you really want to know where you are. You know? So that business, is not, this was a very good, sticky business. And so they say, they see, oh gosh, GPS is going from a product to a feature. That's basically just a feature of a smartphone. Oh, let's not relax to the inevitable and just get out of the business. Let's double down and go into handsets and compete with Ericsson and Nokia. Completely moronic. And so again, you see investing outside the moat. You see a business do that out of weakness as opposed to out of strength when they're trying to like, maintain growth like Cisco did. It's a horrible sign. Yep, question. How do you differentiate that from like, being innovative? Like Google, for example. Great question. No, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. Um, so the, the question is, how do you differentiate that from being innovative? Because Google's doing it out of strength. Right? Google's not doing it to preserve growth or because their core business is dying. Google's doing it as a way of planting seeds for hopefully a great business in the future. And that means a subtle difference. But it's going, coming out, the key thing is it's coming out of strength. Google's core business isn't going down. It's when you see a company's core business either slowing or the competitive advantage eroding, and they try to basically invest outside that to bump up growth. So you know, Cisco, one of the reasons they went into consumer electronics, Netgear, was to compensate for the fact that the enterprise market was slowing down. Or you can just say, Hey guys, we'll grow at six percent, not sixteen anymore. That would have been the more rational response. Instead, they go out and take a blowtorch to giant, giant piles of cash by buying. Remember the flip? Remember the flip? Eight hundred million bucks on this, you know, basically a little video camera that will about six months later be in your phone. I mean, you know, again, out of weakness versus out of strength. Yep. Another question. How much of this uh, kind of uh, stupidity is correlated to the fact that these businesses? that are sometimes wide modes are not run by owner-operators. You so, would imagine if you have an owner-operator, he would not. Yeah. So the, que the, yeah, the question is sort of how much of this stupidity is correlated to businesses that uh, aren't run by owner-operators? Um, I think it's a good, I mean, well, John Chambers owned a decent chunk of Cisco. Um, but I do think you see it less frequently with owner-operator businesses. You see it more frequently with businesses run by hired hands, where if the CEO gets leaves, he'll get a giant golden parachute, and he goes off and plays golf, and nobody's the worse off except the poor saps who own the stock. Um, so I think by, own, by having an owner-operator, you lessen this, this chance, but they're not infallible. I mean, the danger is when you have businesses that can't relax to change. And especially it's when you see this a lot actually with tech companies. No, not just tech companies, but companies when they mature. So this happened to McDonald's, it happened to Home Depot, happened to Starbucks, happened to Cisco, happened to Microsoft. As they get larger and have to go from being growth companies to being mature companies, they start continuing to act like teenagers when they're actually in their 50s. I mean, it's like the 50-year-old guy who's trying to date a 20-year-old. It's just inappropriate. You know? And it's the same thing when you're a super successful business like Starbucks, when they, they were, and they just kept opening new stores, opening new stores. I remember there was a great Onion story once. Starbucks opened Starbucks in Starbucks bathroom. Um, <laughs> you know, because they were just everywhere, right? And Howard Schultz came back and realized that the return on capital for these new stores was really not very high. And so the better way to allocate capital was not open crap loads of new stores. It was slow openings and focus on making more money, increasing ticket sizes, introducing food and so forth at existing stores. So I mean, many businesses go through this transition. Um, yeah, sorry, we'll, we'll get the joker off the screen there. Um, <laughs> now there is, I should say, an exception to every rule about sort of management and, the, and you know, the, the horse being more important than the jockey. There are a tiny minority of managers who can create enormous value via astute capital allocation, even if they don't start with great horses. Uh, Warren Buffett at Berkshire started with a textile mill, for God's sake. Uh, Brian Joffe at Bidvest, which is a South African firm, started with nothing. And now they do logistics, they do um, distribution, they do food service. Amazing business. 
uh, Dick Kovacevic at Wells Fargo. And banking is a tough business, really tough business. But what Kovacevic and Stumpf have done is nothing short of amazing. Uh, Stephen Mitrail's at Danaher. Danaher's actually beaten Berkshire in the past 20 years in terms of shareholder returns. It started off selling industrial pumps, you know, and they bought Beckman Coulter a few years ago, big diagnostics firm. So again, I don't, there is an exception to every rule. There is a tiny minority of managers that can make something out of not much. Um, so keep an eye out for them. They're hard to find, false positives abound, but these guys can create enormous wealth over time. So just a kind of a, a sideline from the moat conversation, but my point here, I don't want you to go out of here thinking management is irrelevant because there is this tiny minority of guys that can just do amazing things. Yeah, there's a question there in the back. I was wondering what's the role of chance in all of these, uh, in the examples of products that are created, like new Coke, maybe mm -hmm. they should not have done that and so on. Yeah. For every new Coke that did not work out, maybe there is another product by some other company that did work out. Sadly, investing does not lend itself well to statistical not, you know, proof, because you have individual examples where you're in highly skewed results, right? Where you have this huge long tail, where a few companies do incredibly well, and a very small number do OK. Uh, you probably would enjoy reading. There's a recent book by some, um, I think they're, McKin no, Deloitte, not McKinsey, Deloitte guys, called, the th called Three Rules, um, where they did a pretty rigorous statistical uh, analysis on returns on capital. And then went back and they did a whole bunch of, they did, they, um, did a bunch of pairwise analysis. They did, uh, they did a lot of controlling for industry factors to try to kind of eliminate the odds of luck happening with things and looking sort of over what characteristics identified businesses that were likely to succeed over a long period of time. But there is a luck component to this, right? I mean, example from Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, Warren Buffett, uh, when early on, went to Washington, D.C. on the weekend to try to learn about insurance at Geico. He got the janitor. He, he basically banged on the door of Geico. And I can't remember the manager's name, but one of you Buffett nuts probably remembers. Let him in and basically gave him like a five-hour lesson on how to run and how to do insurance well. If that hadn't happened, would he have really gotten the early tutelage in insurance and then created what Berkshire became? Maybe not. You know, so you know, you're abs I don't, again, my point here is simply, I don't want to admit, you know, luck happens, right? I mean, chance is part of it. But you, your, your choice is either say, this stuff is unknowable and I'm just going to index, which is a completely rational thing to do, by the way. Um, or if we want to try to identify these businesses, we look for common characteristics that seem to have held up over long periods of time. But there, you know, there is a role of chance in creating successful companies. And that's, that's a weakness of like, good to great, uh, you know, the built to last and a lot of these success studies. That you would also enjoy a book called The Halo Effect, which really does a, a great job kind of basically disintegrating the idea of the hero CEO. It's a really good book. Yeah. So you talked about two possible approaches. What about the third one where we know for a large number of businesses, especially the majority of businesses, returns are going to revert to mean. And temporarily, you can see certain businesses, uh, the, uh, the returns are extremely low. Mm -hmm. And maybe the valuation is even lower. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of does not reflect the fact that maybe over time it will revert to mean. And maybe you can identify a certain industry. So these are the, these are the, the, ben Graham the crappy businesses that go to being semi-crappy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I know what you mean. The businesses that are sort of low returns on capital that go up to the average. It's a, look, I mean, that's, that's kind of traditional value investing, right? So to find the businesses, business that's priced as if it's going to go out of business, and if it survives, you do pretty well. Right? Um, or it goes from a 2% margin business to a 5% margin business. That is a fine way to invest. Typically, these are not kind of modi businesses. It's more what we call kind of cigar butt investing. Again, you can make plenty of money that way. Um, it's not how I choose to invest, but plenty of people make lots of money that way. Um, what I would say is the only the issue if you're going to pursue that approach is time is not your friend. Because the intrinsic value of those businesses is declining over time. And if they don't turn around quickly, you're left with a declining asset. Whereas, there's a great quote from Bob Goldfarb at the Sequoia Fund, that time is the friend of the wonderful business, uh, which is true, because it builds value over time. And that becomes into sort of an additional margin of safety. So again, if you are going to go kind of for deep value, dumpster diving, 
you can make a lot of money, but just be aware that you may want to cut your, you, you may want to be aware of timing is all I'm saying, because the, the, what you're buying is probably declining in value. So just in a global context, I think it's important to remember, local differences can create moats, okay? Foreign, country, foreign companies aren't allowed to, allowed to own banks in Canada. Thus, the Canadian banks will always be insanely profitable, much more profitable than banks in almost any other part of the world. Uh, in Germany, this is a great one. Most German municipalities don't allow you to wash your car in your driveway or on the street because of environmental regulations. So car washing is actually a pretty good business in Germany. Because Germans like cars and you can't wash in your driveway, right? And so there's a pretty good business called WashTech that makes money basically providing all the consumables, the detergents and stuff, in car washes. This business could not exist in the US. But, so that's a local difference. Um, so you know, they can create moats. You also see minimum efficient scale being more common. So retailing is a tough business in the US. So it's a huge market, easy to come in. South African retailers have returns on ca capital that make Costco look like an airline. It's not entirely true, but they're, they're great returns on capital. And the reason is simple. It's a relatively small market. And once you've got the two or three big players, it's really hard for anybody else to compete. And global players aren't going to come in because it's just not that big a market. Why am I going to bother spending a ton of money coming into South Africa? Uh, Walmart recently came in, but they just bought a local player. They didn't try to come in on themselves. Um, Beck World uh, is the largest producer of Thai language media. So I mean, if you watch, want to watch a soap opera in Thailand, a news broadcast, they own most of the pay TV channels. It's awesome business. Um, I mean, Thailand's a big country. It's not a, it's a bit, Thai is not as commonly spoken as, say, English. So you're not, you're minimum efficient scale. The odds that you have a competitor coming in there are lower than if you created, say, English language content. And then you also get cultural preferences. You know, for example, beer travels. Beer can you know, often be exported. And, you know, I mean, when I was in Macau last week, Carlsberg all over the place. It's a crappy beer. I don't know why. But Carlsberg seemed to be doing well there. Um, beer travels pretty well. Spirits travel pretty well. Candy and snacks don't. The snacks you grew up with, the candy you grew up with is what you will probably eat the rest of your life. You try to sell Hershey's in the UK, and they say it basically tastes like cardboard. You know, whereas Cadbury to most Americans is much too sweet. And like the Mexicans had this chocolate bar called Carlos Quinto, which basically is cardboard, as far as I can tell. <laughs> like, no, I mean, like the bar, actually, they, because they have to change the packaging in the US, it actually says chocolate style bar. You know, like it's, it's like, you know, craft and cheese product, you know? But anyway, so these are cultural. Calbi. Calbi is a company in Japan that makes Japanese snacks that are never going to sell in the US. But Frito Lay ain't going to sell much in, China, in Japan either. So these cultural differences can create moats in different countries. Um, so why does all this matter? Why am I talking about moats? Who cares? Pretty simple. Moats add intrinsic value. A company that can compound cash flow for many years is simply worth more than a firm that can't. And you can think about this here simply with you've got returns on capital on the vertical axis, time on the horizontal axis. And for the no-mode business, returns on capital come down pretty fast as competition comes in. So there's less time for value to compound as you reinvest cash. For the wide-mode business, you have longer span of time to reinvest capital at a high incremental rate of return. Now, this brings up the question of valuing moats. Uh, and if you're looking at a business, thinking about investing in a moaty company, the value is largely dependent on reinvestment opportunities. The ability to reinvest cash at a high incremental rate of return is a very valuable moat. If you can plow that cash back into the business, continue to take market share, expand your addressable market, you have a long runway ahead of you, that makes a business worth paying a pretty high multiple for. You know, I think uh, you, someone mentioned me, Whitney Tilson was here a while ago, said so he didn't buy Google kind of early on because the PE was high. But Google had this opportunity to reinvest in the moat in a huge way. Um, Fastenal has this. XPO, which is a logistics company that does truck brokerage, same thing. By contrast, if a firm has little ability to reinvest, the moat doesn't add much to intrinsic value. It adds certainty. It adds confidence. It narrows the range of possible outcomes. But it doesn't add much to the value because they can't reinvest. Think about McCormick. McCormick owns the spice market in the US. They own most of the private label spices you get from McCormick. You know, then they have the, the M labeled ones that you see. But you know what? The consumption of turmeric is not going up 20% next year. <coughs> OK, not happening, all right? Um, and so McCormick has to pay out most of the money. 
So that moat is valuable in creating stability and creating confidence. It doesn't really say I want to pay 30 times for this business because they can't reinvest it back in. Microsoft, Oracle, very similar things. They just the cash has to come out because they have nowhere to put it. And, and another important takeaway is that moats are not limited to these super stable companies your grandkids can own, the Warren Buffett inevitables. Uh, those are a fairly small subset of the investable universe. And as I just mentioned, they have very limited reinvestment opportunities. Modi businesses that pay out cash are good, but Modi businesses that can reinvest cash back in the business are truly awesome things. And when you can find those at reasonable valuations, it is very likely they'll make you a lot of money. And so when you think about investing in moats, the, the last takeaway I'll leave you is that overestimating the moat means you'll pay for value creation that never materializes. Underestimating the moat means you have a large opportunity cost. So let's look at a real cost example, Motorola. Okay, this is a chart of Motorola from um, 03 to 2012. Remember the Razor? How many of you owned a Razor? Fair amount. How many of you owned a Razor three years later? And that would be nobody. Okay, exactly. So the Razor is released, right? And everybody goes bananas, and Motorola goes to 22% market share. And the market says, wow, this is fantastic. You got a moat, you got this great Razor franchise. It's a piece of hardware. There's no proprietary software and there's no switching cost. As soon as the next cool phone comes out, you go and go buy that, which is exactly what happened. And so we see what happens. Stock craters, moat has 10% market share. People basically overestimated the value of the moat and got hosed on the stock because of that. Hosed is a technical term we use in the financial industry. Um, now there's an opportunity cost example in Walmart. So this is Walmart from about 95, 97 bananas to 99 to, to, through today. Buffett, and this is a story he told at the Berkshire meeting about 04, 06, um, they started to buy several million shares of Walmart back in 95. And it moved, and then he said, you know, it's, it's prices moved up by an eighth. Let's wait a bit. Let's not buy anymore. And you look what happened to the stock. Stock went from 10 to 50, right, basically. That decision, and this is a number he gave at the meeting, he said that thought what he called thumb sucking on, on Walmart, basically not buying enough cost Berkshire $8 billion in money they could have made. And the reason was at that time they said, eh, Walmart's a good retailer. They didn't say Walmart is an awesome retailer. And so we'll pay up a little bit for that. The point here being that when you find a truly awesome business, I mean, don't pay 100 times earnings, which is you know, what Cisco was trading for in 1999, um, but you pay more. It's worth more. It's going to compound at a high rate because then you suffer opportunity cost and most investors I've found spend a lot of time on margin of safety and not a lot on opportunity cost. And it's something to really think hard about, I think. And people often ask me, isn't the moat already priced in? We already know these are great businesses, right? Well, less often than you think, because most investors own, period, own securities for very short time periods. The average US mutual fund has turnover of about 100%. It's about a one year holding period. That's the average. There's plenty of folks who, you know, three months is a long holding period. Moats matter in the long run, not the short run. Most investors also assume the current state of the world persists for longer than it really does. And so when things are tough for a great business, they say things will be tough forever. Not that this moat will help the business bounce back. And finally, most investors focus on short-term changes in price, not long-term changes in moats. Because finding moats means finding inefficiency. What I found is that quantitative data in the market tends to be very efficiently priced. Qualitative insight understanding the structural characteristics of the business, the switching costs, why do customers behave the way they do? Why can this company raise prices a little bit every year? That tends to be less efficiently priced because, great quote from Bill Miller, all of the information is in the past, but all of the value is in the future. So the future value creation will often come from things you can see today, not necessarily the information that occurred in the past. And with that, we'll do more questions. Thanks, guys. The question is about the process you follow once you have identified the moat companies. Yeah. And once you have these companies, do you try to do an analysis as to what this company could be worth or what cash it can bring in in 10 years or 15 years to compare between the two companies that have, that have the moats? And now, once you have selected a set of companies that have a good moat, what is the next step? How do you sure. further no, so it's a good So it's a good question about just process in general. And I think you know, establishing that mental database 
the database of companies that I would like to own this at some price because the competitive advantages and the compounding potential are things that I think are, are above average or, or solid. Um, you know, typically I think it, it's a good idea to sort of at least get a kind of a, a rough idea. Like what I pay, you know, what I want to buy this at a 5% free cash yield, but I want to buy this at an 8% free cash yield because it's not growing very much. Uh, just a, something super rough. Uh, and then you just wait. And as it gets closer to that valuation, then you really ramp up the work. Then you do the really hardcore analysis. We put together a discounted cash flow and say, okay, was my initial idea right? You know, um, but you kind of have to establish some kind of stake in the ground, some initial idea, or you don't know when to really dig deep. And you can't dig deep on everything, uh, even if you do this for a living, which, which I do. So a follow-on question just on that. Yeah. Um, now, if we are following that approach, that once you have identified the more companies, then do some kind of an analysis and get a rough estimate, then it doesn't really matter you had two classes of mode over there. One a mode that's investing in itself, and one a mode that's just giving the share the money out. Yeah. Yep. Good way uh, to segment it. Then that distinction doesn't matter much if you are doing a follow-on analysis where you're coming up with these numbers. Well, and, yeah. It only matters in what you would want to pay for it, probably, right? Because a, a business like a, a McCormick, for example, you're not going to pay 30 times earnings for this because it's just it's never going to grow at a you know it's never going to compound at a huge pace. Um, uh, a business, you know, whether it's a Google or a company, I'd better put it up there as Kiro, which is doing um, for-profit secondary education in South Africa, which has a huge dearth of schools, insanely profitable. There, you'd pay a lot because there's this massive runway ahead of it. Uh, and so, you, and also, I think the thing to keep bear in mind there is that for the mature business that's probably paying out a lot, you're probably going to make most of your money on the closing of price and value, because intrinsic value is only growing at a very steady pace. Whereas for the, the, the business that can reinvest in itself, that has that long runway ahead, you're probably going to make more of your money over time on the compounding of intrinsic value. So then a smaller margin of safety makes more sense because you're going to make all this money from it growing and you know, not from that closing of price and value. And also, like if you were to wait for, say, Visa to get to 10 times earnings, you'd just never own it. Uh, and that, that's the opportunity cost I was referring to. If you can give us a little bit more insight in the process uh, that you guys followed at Morningstar and maybe what you follow. One of the interesting things is uh, Morningstar has made it really accessible for us to go and figure out what are the white mode businesses, kind of reverse engineer some of these things mm -hmm. by looking at the analysis. But I think the real value is in going and doing your own work. Uh, I've heard you talk about following the value chain. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can just talk about how do you actually go about finding things that are not well recognized even as a white mode? Like, sure. there's a standard list of things that are widely recognized as white mode yeah. companies in the US. But say you want to do your own work, how would yeah. you go about it? Great example. So, I'll give you a couple of value chain examples. So, um, you know, the Cokes and the Diageos and the Wrigleys and the Nestles, these are all pretty good businesses, right? So, let's think about this. They probably have to get their ingredients from somewhere, right? Well, there's a group of companies, called, one's called Javaldum, one's called International Food and Flavors, it's the only one in the US. Um, one's called Simrise, there's one in the Ireland called Kerry, that basically, they're flavor specialists. And they make, you know, when a company wants a particular characteristic, like a particular kind of mouthfeel, a particular kind of flavor, sometimes they'll do it themselves, oftentimes they'll turn to these companies that are ingredient companies, basically. And there's about four or five of them in the world, insanely profitable. Because, of course, once you have like, the component that makes Fritos crunch the way they crunch, you're not changing that, right? You're done. Or another example would be there's a company called Novozymes, another one called Christopher Hansen, both European. They make enzymes, enzymes that will help your beer stay fresh, enzymes that will accelerate the process of yogurt development. You know, again, things that are massively important to the eventual experience that the customer has, but that are pretty tiny costs of the other inputs. And it's, that's a value chain thing, just following that value chain back. Um, aircraft, another thing. So, you know, we know that airlines kind of are a stinky industry, um, but they got to get the parts from somewhere. They're like, okay, so then you look at Boeing and Airbus. Those are okay businesses. And the reason is very simple. People think these should be awesome businesses, right? Because they're huge and only two companies can make airplanes, right? And or wide bodies. But at the end of the day, an airplane, it's a commodity, right? If I'm Emirates or I'm United, I want the airline that gets the most people, the furthest distance at the cheapest price. I don't care if it's from Boeing or Airbus. 
You don't care. Do any of you care if you fly a Boeing or an Airbus? Who cares, right? I mean, I guess the A380 is kind of cool. I've always wanted to fly on one. Um, but I'm not going to like pay some massive premium just to fly on it. Um, so they're in eh, commodity business. OK, so let's follow you way back. Aircraft, these, they got to get parts from somewhere, right? Hmm. Well, the parts tend to be pretty specialized and highly engineered. They're customized for every different airframe. The fuel pumps in the 737 are different than the fuel pumps in the 757 or the A320. And they tend to be sole source because they're developed when the aircraft is developed. Boeing and Airbus are just assemblers. That's really all they're doing is assembling for the most part. And so then you get this aftermarket business that's you know, sole source. And as long as that airplane's flying, you got one guy you can get the part from. And he is going to have you over a barrel, charge you whatever he wants. And so that's, that's another kind of value chain example. Just kind of doing, you, know, you also just do a map. Like look at the company and say, OK, these guys, they got to get this input from somewhere, this input from somewhere, this input from somewhere. Where is the money made? I mean, in every industry, you just do a value map and say, and sometimes there's almost nowhere to make. I mean, auto parts. Ugh. I mean, almost no one makes money in this industry. Except there is, a, I mean, Johnson Controls does pretty well because they'll do like the whole interior and just kind of slot it in. Or there's a company called Gentex that does auto dimming rear view mirrors. And they have some patents on that that make it pretty profitable. But those are just a couple of examples. Auto retailing is probably Auto retailing is not a bad business. Um, yeah, that's I a pretty. Auto part retailing. Yeah, well, auto part retailing. Yeah, yeah, auto zone. And yeah, and again, you kind of, yeah, you go back and the reason is pretty simple because if you're the mechanic, that, that the cost of that part is passed through. Like if you take your car in to get repaired, you're not shopping for the part. The mechanic is shopping for the part. He just passes through the cost to you. So if there's a margin made on it, what, you don't know what a fan belt costs. Maybe you do know what a fan belt costs. I don't know. Um, but I mean, I, I barely could look, know what a carburetor is, much less could I price the darn thing. So again, you, know, you had this disconnect between the payer and the, and the buyer. So you touched upon the valuation in the last part, and then there are a couple of questions. Uh, when it's an emerging mode, uh, it looks like some of the signs of emerging modes are there. Often, the return ratios are poor. Uh, the valuations optically seemed higher yeah. because the company yep. has not started churning cash out. Mm -hmm. How would you value a business in that state, or rather yeah. value a mode in that state? Yeah, sure. No, great question. Um, so that's where a discounted cash flow analysis really becomes useful. And it's not that DCF is a magic bullet and it's better. It just it forces you to think through the cash economics of the business over the long run, as opposed to the gap accounting characteristics over the short run, which is what a PE will do. So in the case of a business that say it's growing quickly, returns are poor today, um, but it looks like there's something there. It looks like there could be a moat. What I would say is this: think about variable versus think about three things: opportunity set, fixed, and variable costs. Okay, so what is the opportunity set here, right? How big could this thing get? What could they sell to people in five, three years' time, five years' time, whatever? Um, and then say, OK, to get there, they will need to invest something. right? There's some number amount. They'll need to build new plants, hire new engineers, whatever it might be. And then there'll be a flow through, too. Something amount will drop to the bottom line. And over time, more should drop to the bottom line if it's a decent business. right? Who knows what it is? Um, and so I mean, you, just, and you just kind of math that out, right? just DCF it out. And then say, OK, this company could go from a 6% return on capital to a 12% return on capital in five years and start generating free cash flow. And then we get a hockey stick after that as you kind of do it out. So for example, we're looking at a business right now called SimCorp, which does um, basically ex in very expensive back-end software for huge asset managers, like 100 billion plus asset managers, um, because it runs the whole back office suite. Now, they've been selling, basically, they've been growing about 5 6% per year for the past few years, because they've not done well in the US market for a bunch of reasons that we think may be fixable. That's what we're trying to figure out. But basically, we've talked to them. And that 5 6% growth pretty much covers their cost structure now and gets them about a low 20s margin. But they incre every incre bit of incremental growth over that, so going from 5% to 10%, you get an 80 to 90% drop through. You know, and, then, and then that then you know, takes your margins from probably low 20s up a lot. But you don't know what that number is until you think it through. Another good so another example. So when Morningstar initiated on, on MasterCard, and when it went public at 40, 50 bucks a share, you know, the, um, I remember our analyst wanted to put like a $100, $110 price target on it. And I was like, dude, you're nuts, man. This thing's coming public at like 40 bucks. 
got to stick our necks out that far. Come on. You know, this thing, how, how good a business is this? And he, what he did is he just walked through fixed versus variable. That basically, OK, very little variable cost in this business. You've got a fixed cost of a network, you know, the data processing network. But then of the, the incremental revenue, tons will flow down to the bottom line. And this is where, and this is a geek thing, but you guys may have, when you're modeling out a high growth company, don't model in percentages, model in dollars. So it optically looks weird to say margins are going to go from 13% to 25. Ah, that's, this is huge. My god, that's never going to happen. So don't do it in percentages. Don't do operating margins doing from x to y. Think about, OK, fixed versus variable. How many dollars will they need to spend to get each dollar of additional revenue? And then see what operating margin falls out of that. And you may come to a very different conclusion. Yeah, it's operating leverage. And I've found that operating leverage is frequently one of the most mispriced things in the market. Because nobody wants to like, hand their boss, the portfolio manager, or the director of research, you know, a model that shows something going from 13 to 30% margins. Because they're going to get it back, and they're going to say, you're nuts, man. There's no way. Forget about it. Like, we're in nah. um, Again, but it can happen. It happened with you know, CME. It happened with MasterCard. It's happened with Google. It happened with OpenTable. You know, when you get these network effect businesses with you know, very, very high incremental returns because you get this high flow through ratio of additional revenue dollars, margins can do some pretty interesting things. But you'll only figure that out if you do model in dollars. You've got to just think about that. You know, what do I need to spend for each additional dollar in revenue? So uh, for network effect, right? Yeah. Uh, I usually think about like eBay or Alibaba. But those kind of networks seem like the Western digital network you talk about is a radio network, not a uh, not something like Facebook. Um, so mm -hmm. because they only sell us to the buyer, it's not like buyer sells stuff to another buyer and all this stuff. Oh, OK. That's a really interesting way to think about it. No, OK, I, I see what you're saying. You're right. It is just seller to buyer. But the more buyers who are there, the more sellers are going to want to be on the platform. Right? It's not as if it's just selling one good. Like, let, let, let's imagine that eBay could only sell baseball cards. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Whatever. Then you could have someone say, OK, I can pick that market off. I, I could invent a better platform for selling baseball cards. Um, whereas if you know that I can, if whatever I want, I'm probably going to find it there. And whatever I want to sell, I'm going to find it there. That creates all those connections. But I, but I kind of see where that, that's kind of, I'd never thought about uh, the, the, you could mistake that for being a radial network. I wouldn't characterize it that way um, because any buyer can interact with that. that that's the best way to describe it. Any buyer on eBay can interact with any seller, right? Uh -huh. um, and depending on what they want to buy or sell, that transaction could occur. Whereas, although I can send money from Bangladesh to Mexico City, to go back to that example, there's, not, there's no reason to, right? I mean, you don't have people immigrating. And immigrants are one of the biggest users of the Western Union network to send money back home, remittances, right? Um, you just don't have people who move from Mexico City to Bangladesh or vice versa. Uh, I, there may be a huge Mexican population in Bangladesh. I don't know. I don't think there is. Um, but but I, the, that was a cool way of thinking about it. I, yeah. Thank you. So I have uh, one question, Pat. I'm always very curious about when, you know, just from a learning perspective, um, what would you say have some of, you know, looking back 10 years, what have been some of your uh, you know, prominent mistakes and sort of mm -hmm. what you've learned from them. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a good one. Um, thank you for airing, forcing me to air my dirty laundry, sir. I appreciate that. It'll go on uh, YouTube. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, yes, hello, YouTube. How are you? Um, no, seriously. Um, no, it's a really, it's actually, it's a very good question. And I would say that, um, you know, I've gotten that operating leverage thing right a couple of times. I've missed it more times than I should have. Um, so that's that's one that annoys me when I think about it, is, is that thinking carefully about operating leverage, thinking carefully about network effects and runways, I, I have done OK at that, but not as well as I should have. There's, there's some, some pitches I missed that would have been home runs, I think. Um, the bigger one, though, is probably management. Um, you know, I've definitely, as I've done more work on businesses that are not mega caps, they're smaller because management can have a bigger effect on a smaller business. Just easier to you know, drive a sports car versus a Mack truck. Um, 
And as I've done more work on what I would call capital allocator business models, uh, like Brookfield Asset Management or Onyx in Toronto or Roper or PSG in South Africa, which we own, um, I've gained a, a much greater appreciation for what the truly exceptional managers can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of this also came from kind of a, as I reflect on it, I think some of this came from kind of a, a reaction to the kind of 1990s hero CEO thing, you know, where you know John Chambers was God, Howard Schultz at Starbucks was God, you know, um, and it's this sort of cult of the hero CEO that we've developed in the U, especially the U.S., um, where you know, pretty much every CEO in the U.S. is vastly overpaid for the value they deliver, um, and you know, option expensing. You remember was a huge battle, um, and so I think some of that that management doesn't matter as much. Some of it was probably just a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to a lot of that. It's probably fair to say. But you know, with time, hopefully I've kind of, the, the knee's not jerking as much. Um, and I guess I've just developed a better appreciation for what the truly exceptional manager can do. Uh, and again, I do want to emphasize truly exceptional. And you are not truly exceptional because you're on the cover of Forbes or Fortune. You, know, you are not truly exceptional because you have a giant pay package. You are truly exceptional because you are passionate about your business and you understand how to allocate capital. That's what makes an exceptional manager. But I would say that's something I wish I had appreciated earlier in my investing career, but something we're working hard to correct right now. I mean, in our, in our current portfolio of 14 companies, five are of what I would call this capital allocator model. Awesome. Thanks. Actually, that brought to mind uh, one of the books, uh, The Outsiders. Uh, yeah, great uh, book. Yeah, about capital allocation. Yeah, great, Outsiders is a great. If you haven't read The Outsiders, it's an awesome book on management. Will Thorndike wrote it. Um, yeah, no, definitely, uh, that, that'd, be a, that'd be in a top 10 past couple of years book. So while we're talking about emerging modes uh, one and like good capital allocators, one example that you brought up uh, is uh, Danaher. Yep. The Riles brothers, uh, they have a- Colfax. A Colfax, which right now is in the news quite a bit because they sell to oil and gas quite a yep. bit. Yep, yep. And this is one of a kind of an emerging mode where yep. we don't really see it in the numbers yet. Yep. Would you have any thoughts that you would like to share with us? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, well, one is don't bet against the Rails Brothers. Uh, that, that's a low odds bet. Um, no, Colfax is getting interesting. I mean, I, we, need, we need to ramp up our work on it right now um, because you know, we sort of have a list of great businesses that sell into oil and gas that are kind of just gotten whacked lately. Um, you know, I have not followed Colfax too closely. I mean, I, we owned it um, after the charter acquisition um, when they you know, basically bought a company three, four times their size and created enormous value almost overnight uh, with what they did with that business. Um, I, th I mean, I think I would say the rails are amazing managers and it's very fertile ground for, for more research and more work. Um, what I would say, you know, the, the Colfax model currently is buy solid businesses and make them much be better businesses via lean manufacturing techniques for the most part, you know, the, the Dana Herb, the Colfax business system. Um, it's different than say like a, a Roper or a PSG, both businesses we do own, which tend to own great businesses that they want to make even better via uh, additional investment or uh, better capital allocation. So, but the Rails brothers are tough ones to bet against. The hard part is when you are kind of watching it as it stands as a snapshot, today yeah. uh, is do these underlying businesses really have any kind of moat or not? Yeah. Uh, and since there are no, there's no numerical evidence, it's hard. How do you actually go out and do independent research and say, yes, these businesses actually have a moat now yeah. that they're under Colfax? Yeah, so there's a couple things to look at there. One is looking carefully at the end markets there, I think, you know, because you're looking for what the numbers could become, not what they are today. And so there you want to almost get in the customer's head. Right, and say, why does a customer buy a pump from Dana Her? Why does it buy a fan from Howden? Um, you know, why does it buy welding equipment from ESAB? Um, and then get in the customer's head and then see what their behavior is. And maybe there's reasons why they're sticky. I don't, I don't, don't know. That would be a way to kind of go down that path. But then also, and this kind of goes back to the one slide about the truly amazing managers, operational excellence can become strategic advantage, rarely. But in the hands of, like an ITW would be a good example, in the hands of a truly, you know, four standard deviation manager, um, 
operational excellence, the Dana Her business system back at Dana Her, can become strategic advantage because you just you do everything so much more efficiently than everybody else. You do a little, you you manage to eke out an economic moat out of that. Not common. Uh, not something I would you know try to have a whole portfolio of those because they're pretty tough to find. But I would say that uh, the track record of the Rails brothers is good enough that um, if anyone can turn operational excellence into strategic advantage, they, they would be on the pretty short list. All right. Thanks, Pat. With that, thank you very much for Thanks, such Rob. an enlightening talk. This, this has been fun. Awesome. Thanks. This has been fun.